It's hard to imagine living in a time when all of this was under very real threat, let alone leaving all this to go and fight in a war hundreds of miles away. In 1914, the lives of every single person living in Britain changed overnight. Yet this was a very different way of living, a very different society where women had distinct roles, including what work they were allowed to do for those who were allowed to work at all. This tells the story of Trilby McDowell, a young woman from Scotland who did not accept that she could not do anything to help the war effort and left everything she knew to go and volunteer on the front lines with a then unknown first aid nursing unit. This project has seen the collaboration of children and young people from East Sussex and the Highlands and volunteers from all over Scotland and England. These people have had experiences peeking into a world which is now out of living memory and these are experiences that they will never forget. It is so important that we keep the spirit of these people alive. These brave women and men really did ensure that we can all live the lives that we have. First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, Fanny, owes its origins to Sergeant Major Edward Baker in the cavalry in the Boer War. In the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, he was wounded in the shin and lay on the battlefield for hours waiting to be picked up by stretcher bearers who were finding it very difficult to navigate the terrain. Lots of men were dying on the battlefield. If there was some kind of ambulance service, they could have been taken to advanced dressing stations and they probably would have survived. It was here that he began to have an idea, a vision or a fantasy. Women on horseback coming to the rescue. Dressed in a bright, beautiful scarlet uniform, riding side saddle onto the battlefield to administer first aid to the wounded men. Then, having tended their wounds, hoist the men onto their horses and gallop off to safety. In September 1907, he finally founded and established the Corps, putting his dream into action. Recruitment drives were held in the early years with the emphasis always on attracting young women who could already ride and who owned their own horses. However, by 1911, the Corps was being led by Grace Ashley Smith, a feisty, no-nonsense Scottish woman, and Lillian Franklin, who became the first commanding officer, always known as Boss. They helped to introduce a more practical uniform and tougher and more serious training. Early camps considered of mainly riding and first aid. Mary Baxter Ellis, who was a commanding officer in the 1930s, noted that the call was created out of a very feminine idealism centred around that great Victorian heroine, Florence Nightingale. A major step forward came with the annual camp in 1913 held at Purbright, which lasted two weeks and saw the brigade of guards taking them under their wing beginning a connection which continues to this day. When the First World War broke out in 1914, the Fanny quickly followed up on their military contacts, but to no avail. Everyone refused to take them. Grace Ashley Smith was on board a ship bound for South Africa to visit relatives when war was declared. She immediately turned back and set sail for home. One of the fellow voyagers was the Belgian minister for the colonies, and he decided that if the British would not have them, the Belgians would. Back in the UK, Grace Ashley Smith acquired an ambulance and returned with six fannies. They crossed to Calais on the 27th of October 1914 to drive ambulances for the Belgians and the French. This date marks the official start of the Fanny's wartime service and is still the nearest date to which they hold the annual corps reunion. On the 29th of October, they took over a dirty and decayed convent school opposite the Church of Notre Dame called Lamarck Hospital. The wounded were being brought in before the Fanny's even had time to unpack. The conditions they had to contend with, even without the shell fire, were fairly arduous. The vehicles were those with rudimentary screens or no screens, uncertain engines and tyres depressingly prone to punctures. 
The Fanny also performed other duties as required, setting up regimental aid posts, motor kitchens, and even a mobile bath service. This had been brought over by Fanny's Marion and Hope Gamwell and was called James and offered the luxury of a hot bath to 40 men per hour. In all, during the First World War, Fanny's were awarded 17 military medals, 27 Croix de Guerre, one Légion d'Honneur, and 11 mentions in dispatches. So who were the women of the Fanny? At the time, and in such a structured society, where women of every class were seen in a very particular way, and most women were not allowed to work, this organisation is very progressive. However, its roots are in the conservative and traditional attitudes of the time, that women are innately caring and good at nursing. Yet again, the idea of women actually being on the battlefield was entirely new to Victorian and early Edwardian society. Edward Baker noted that, Should ever the horrors of war loom in our horizon, they shall not shirk the task in front of them but will ride forward with stout hearts and willing hands to render the great service to our country and gain great laurels for the brow of womanhood. In the same article, Baker writes, These women will follow the fighting line as closely as possible, ride with the skirmishing parties and take their chances with them. Mary Baxter Ellis states, the fanny was created out of the old world. It belonged to the age of the horse, its members primarily horsewomen. So, it's clear that this was an organisation aimed at women who were wealthy and excellent horse riders. Curiously, this is also the reason that women gave for joining in the first place, not to do with nursing. Also, up to this point, women rode side saddle. Now, suddenly, they were riding astride. It was not seemly for a woman to do this, so again, this was hugely progressive. These were women who had lived quite constrained lives. Upper class women in this time would perhaps be involved in a bit of philanthropy, a bit of charitable work. Obviously, none of them were expected to have a career. Here was an opportunity, albeit voluntary and unpaid to join an organisation, to mix with other women, to do some horse riding, and perhaps do things they had never previously been allowed to do, which was hugely appealing. So what were their tasks for these modern young women? They drove cars, they started cars, which was hand cranking an engine, which was physically exhausting. They fixed cars, including punctures, all previously been held by male roles. There was cycling, which was also very progressive and very feminine. They went to camp. They did domestic tasks, such as peeling potatoes at camp, which would previously always have been done by servants. They did basic nursing and first aid. They did stretcher bearing, which was previously main roles. And they wore a uniform, which changed from the original scarlet tunic and blue skirt to khaki in 1910-1911, with hemlines starting to rise just above the ankles and pockets previously unheard of in women's clothing. What happened next? What happened after the First World War? They also played a vital role in the Second World War. The Fannies were the wireless operators and coders that were receiving messages from men and women that trained in unarmed and armed combat and parachuted into occupied France. They carried on and are still active today, known as the Princess Royals Volunteer Corps. When there is a terrorist attack, they will be staffing communication lines, telephones, help desks. It's an organisation that women belong to because they are wanting to be in a women's organisation that does exciting things. The Fannies today do so much more and the training is rigorous, akin to army training. We were lucky enough to find and interview a current member, Rachel, who joined for exactly the same reason as those original women did, to be useful for adventure, for sorority and to be useful to their country. So just who was this Trilby McDowell? Trilby McDowell joined the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry in 1916, aged just 20. I need to contribute to this war. 
There must be something I can do. She was stationed at Calais, France, which was subjected to some heavy bombing. She then went to Belgium, where the Fanny had become affiliated to the Belgian army. Trilby said it was quite strange when we went home on leave. We would have to register as aliens because we were members of the Belgian army. She drove an ambulance just behind front lines in the First World War, flew in an Avro biplane and received the Belgian Order of Elizabeth and the Croix de Guerre from the French. Trilby stayed on in Germany until 1920 as a guide driving people around, showing them places of interest. Her letters are candid and open and talk excitedly of dances and dinners and meeting handsome men, as well as her duties and tasks as a fanny. It is clear that it was an adventure for her, and if she was ever afraid, it certainly doesn't show in her letters. She is driven, tireless, and incredibly hard work. I've been having such a gorgeous time, I must write and tell you all about it. On Monday, Major Perkins and another brigade major from HQ came down and took us out for lunch, and we did a lot of shopping for a dance which they were giving. He really is a dear Major Perkins, Fearfully good-looking and attractive, but of course married. All the nicest people are out here. On Tuesday, we had a great bathing party. A real pucker Major General, Colonel Goslett and Major Perks went down in a glorious car to the shore and had great fun. I must say, I like those staff people enormously. They are so awfully easy to get on with and altogether charming. Then yesterday, Major Perkins came down in a tremendous state of excitement as they were short of girls. So what a time I had. I tried every girl I knew without success, but at last raked up some Canadian nurses. Then off we went. And I have never enjoyed myself so much in all my life. Simply topping men, nearly all brass hats with four generals. A wonderful old chateau with a beautiful garden with a lake and everything. A top hole dinner with a band and then such a dance, I cannot describe it. All men who I really liked and just everything you could wish for. Major Perkins is leaving the division now, so I don't expect we'll see much of him in the future, which is rather sad, he is such a dear boy. We got to bed at 3 o'clock and by 5.15 we were on the road again. Then we bathed this morning and lunched at the plage and we were both so dreadfully sleepy. Even Marple's flow of conversation was stemmed for the time. She being. noted much later, Cologne was wonderful after the armistice. I stayed on till 1920 as a guide driving people around, showing them places of interest. Of course, Cologne was not as devastated in the First World War as it was in the Second World War. After the war, her adventurous spirit kept her travelling all over the globe, including to Singapore, Sri Lanka and India. She wrote to her mother again from Singapore about tennis with Lord Chief Justice and Lady Shaw, dancing at the Europe Hotel, tennis and dancing at the club, more tennis and afternoon tea at Government House, and then she went back to Penang. In 1926, she was spending time with Army Captain Daniel Bullard, and on the 14th of October 1926, they were married in Rangoon. He sadly died in 1938 and Trilby returned to England with their three-year-old son, William. With the onset of the Second World War, she again volunteered and served as a driver with the Fanny, though this time remaining in the UK. In November 1940, she was with the American Ambulance Corps, GB, in Newcastle, but three months later went south and spent most of the war based in Honiton, Devon and Marazion in Cornwall. 1941 was a particularly busy time with the Luftwaffe bombing such places as Plymouth, Exeter and Portland. Even so, Trilby notes, this time it was very dull because I was stationed in England all the time. She finally left the service in October 1945 and retired to her home at Gatehouse of Fleet. There is an Australian newspaper article around 1971 that mentions her Recollections of her in later life by her daughter-in-law are of a very independent lady with firm views, mostly very conservative, on almost everything. She died in June 1987, aged 91. Trilby was an incredible woman, 
uncommonly spirited and seemingly fearless, willing to try her hand at anything and travel anywhere with enormous bravery for everything she did. Most 20-year-old privileged young women were content to stay in Britain, but Trilby went to the firing lines on her own steam to serve king and country. It was a spirit that never lost its fire throughout her life. Without doubt, a woman to admire and be inspired by. This is a project made possible by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. We work with children and adults from St Mark's School in Hadlow Down, East Sussex, England, and young people and adults from Inverness Royal Academy in Scotland, alongside many volunteers from both countries and many partners, plus Trilby McDowell's family. The children, aged 9, 10 and 11 in Hadlo Down, first had to learn about the First World War in order to understand the context. The young people in Inverness already had that basic knowledge, so spent their time researching the First Aid Nurse in Yeomanry and Trilby McDowell. Volunteers worked alongside staff at the Highland Archive Centre, New Haven Fort and Gateways to the First World War to research and understand, alongside many, many other partners. This project has inspired everyone who has worked with it.